Hi, I'm Chuck Lampke, your host for Abide in the Vine. Welcome back. It's been a while, and yet we still have a lot of lockup time ahead of us. So I want to spend a little bit of time going over some of the things that Jesus did following the resurrection on, on Easter Sunday. And he spent the next 40 days in and out talking to his disciples, to his followers, to his followers. And we see a lot of different things that he did. And one of the most wonderful things is the fact that our Lord cared. He cared about Peter. He cared about every one of his disciples. He cared about all of his followers. He loved them to the very end. He never did stop wanting to see them where they needed to be. And that's how he feels about you and I. He doesn't want us to, to just think that he is off somewhere, he's gone to heaven preparing a place for us, and he'll come again and receive us into himself. No, he wants us to understand the intimate relationship that he desires to have with each and every one of us. His life, his, his time here on earth was, was short, virtually uh, about 33 years. That's a short period of time. And during that period of time, the ministry only involved, except for the short one, one portion of time when he was 12 years old and, and confounded the, the elders and the leaders and, 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 the, and the priests uh, in Jerusalem. But other than that, his, his ministry was, was, was about three and a half years, three and a half years of proclaiming the truth. And now we have anywhere from uh, a short time to a long time. Uh, I've been, been ministering the gospel now for over 50 years, and I will continue to do it, hopefully for another 50 or longer. I want to, I want to see the truth of his kingdom established here on earth. That's what he desires for all of us. He desires us to understand the relationship that he created for us in the very beginning so that we would not simply go through this life in a situation where uh, every day was different and whatever the circumstances were, that's what conducted us and told us what to do. No, he left us with things to do. And I want to begin by turning to Luke chapter 22 and verses 31 through 34. So if you would, with me, just turn, turn to the chapter, of uh, the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and look at uh, chapter 22, beginning with verse 31. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt deny, shalt twi thrice deny that thou knowest me. Now this was before his crucifixion. This was the uh, Thursday that, that basically that they, that they had celebrated the, the Passover meal. And he had spent that period of time talking very intimately with his disciples. And during that period of time, he let Peter know, Peter, Satan's going to test you. He's going to tempt you. And I want each and every one of us to understand that we have temptations. We have tests that come our way. Those tests and those temptations, most of us fail time and time again. Jesus was tested. He was tempted in every way that you are and that I am or was. And he was without sin. That's why he could be our sacrifice. But you and I give in. Peter thought for sure, no, Lord, I will, I will never deny thee. I will never, I will never turn my back on you. I'll go to the death with you. That's what he meant. He really felt that. But he was confused when things turned the other way and did deny Jesus. Have you ever denied him? Have you ever turned your back on the Lord and wondered, is there any hope to come back? Have you tasted of the heavenly gift, the things, the wonders of God, the, the powerful uh, things that the Lord has prepared for you and then walked your other way? Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. He doesn't want that to be the end result. So turn to John chapter 13. We're going to look at it a little closer. 
in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 36 through 38. We read this. Again, this is Simon Peter talking to the Lord, the Lord talking to him. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, where are you going? Whither goeth thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can't I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Peter was sure, no, no, that won't happen. I won't do that. I will not walk away from you. I will not deny thee. I would never turn against thee. You gotta remember, when, when Jesus asked his disciples days before, and he said, whom saith that I am? Who do people say I am? Uh, some say, they answered, some respond and say, oh, you're one of the prophets, or oh, you've come back. From, from that, or you're John, or you're this or that. And, Peter, and Jesus said to him, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that unto you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. Peter had an intimate understanding that this was the Christ, this was God. He was and is and always has been. And yet it was only a very few minutes later when Jesus began to talk about his death and the things that would, he would undergo and the suffering and the persecution that, that would, would come his way. And Peter looked at him and said, Lord, far be that from you. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou favorest not the things of God, but the things of man. Now, he wasn't saying that Peter was possessed of the devil. He was saying that, Peter, you are speaking, you are speaking for Satan. You are speaking for the things of the world. At one moment, he is speaking and understanding the glories of God. The next minute, he is speaking and understanding the things of the world. That's where 99% of all Christians live. They're in the world one minute. They're with the Lord the next minute. They vacillate back and forth, tossed to and fro over and over again. And James tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, that that man won't receive anything from God. Do we want to receive the truth of God and do we want to be used of God? Or do we just want to float through life? Happy that we've got a home in heaven. And when the end comes, we'll be ushered into his presence. Will we? It's up to us. Are we keeping his commandments? Are we truly his followers? Are we truly his disciples? That's what, what matters. What, what, what matters isn't what we speak with our mouth. It's what we do with our feet. It's the shoe leather. It's our actions. It's our love. It's, it's, it's how we handle ourselves every single day of our life. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we were to record every word that we ever said, and then we have to go back and listen to it. Oh my, could we stand it? Just, just think for just a minute. In the last day, have you said anything that was unkind? Have you said anything that, that showed you had doubt in your mind? Have you said anything that was, that was negative? Have you spoken words that were not the words of God? That's the problem. The heart is deceitfully wicked of all men. That's why the Lord said that he would, his spirit would not strive from, with man for a long period of time anymore. And this was, this was at the flood. He says, but man shall have 120 years. Now, that was just simply a time frame. Some people have lived longer than that. Many people have lived shorter than that. But the time frame still is true. We're promised 120 years. If we obey his commandments, if we trust him fully, if we put our heart and our life in him, he's given us that time to do his work here upon the face of the earth. And we need to fulfill that time frame. Well, after, after his death and resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, of course, 
on Resurrection Day. And he confronted him at that point in time. And he began to show himself for who he was. And there he, he spoke to all of them. You know, Thomas, remember, wasn't there that, that morning, that, that first evening. But eight days later, Thomas was there. And Thomas says, I will not believe unless I put my fingers in the holes in his hands and put my hand into his side. Then I will believe. But the minute he saw Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are they who have not seen me and yet believe. Now, very few of us have ever stood face to face with Jesus Christ or had a confrontation with the audible voice of God. But that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to understand and believe the words, because of the words that were spoken, the words that were written in the Bible, those things that were the miracles of God that were laid down in the word, we need to believe. If you believe in me, he said, the works that I do, will you do also? And even greater works than these will you do because I go to be with my Father. And I will send you another company. The Father will send you another company. The Holy Spirit came to be that comforter, the one who resides within. Now, Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit all reside within the believer in a different form, but they are there. They abide. They have brought that relationship. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you shall ask what you will and it will be done for you. Therein are you my disciples that you bring much fruit, bear much fruit, and glorify my Father's fruit. Are we glorifying God through the things that we are doing? We shall be known by our fruit. What is our fruit? Is it good? Is it bad? Are we touching lives for Jesus Christ? Are we winning the lost? Are we speaking to those that have not heard? Are we proclaiming the truth of this? Is this your life? Is he your life? He is the only thing, for only what we do for Christ will last. I don't care what kind of a job you have. I don't care uh, what it is that you're doing. You might be a banker. You might be a butcher. You might be a bus driver. You might be an airplane flyer. You might be a hostess. It doesn't matter. You might simply be a housewife. You might be a farmer. You might be a shepherd. What are we? We're his sheep. We have a job to do. And each and every one of us have been given the great commission to go into all the world and to proclaim the gospel to everybody and everyone. And those that would believe and receive, they would have the same blessings that you have, the same blessings that I have. They would be part of the family. In John 21, we see Jesus again appearing unto his followers. And as he does, he states a number of different things. Now, in chapter 21, and I want to look at the entire chapter, so we're going to look at it a portion at a time. We're going to start with chapter 21, the first few verses. And it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. So, there's a group of the disciples that are there. They're all together. And Peter made this statement. Simon Peter said unto them, I'm going fishing. They say unto him, Hey, we'll also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Now, they had already been given a commission by the Lord, to proclaim the gospel, to go into all the world. But here they are, going back to the familiar circumstances, the things they knew, the way that they were, when Jesus came to them and called them to leave their nets, to leave their fishing boats. And he said, I will make you fishers of men. But here it is now, after his death and his resurrection, he has appeared to them a couple different times, three, four, maybe. And at that point in time, 
All of these guys are still together, knowing that they're supposed to be doing the Lord's work and they're supposed to be waiting until they're filled with power from on high and then going forth and just really ministering in power. Pentecost hasn't happened. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the anointing that comes upon the disciples and his followers had not fully taken place. They hadn't really been, as the Bible uses the word, baptized in the Spirit of God. But they went back to what was familiar to them. They just said, I'm going fishing, guys. Let's go. And they all said, yeah, we're going too. Let's go. All night long, they're out there fishing, casting their net into the sea, dragging it in empty, casting it out again, dragging it in empty, casting it out again, dragging it in empty. Basically, they're there. Oh, man. How are we doing? Now, I'm imagining what they're thinking, okay? I can't know what they said because it's not recorded in the Bible. But here they are. They have fished all night long. They haven't caught one fish. Not one. All night. Then we go to verse 4. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said again unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Huh. What? We're casting it on the wrong side. Ah, oh, they were casting it on the left side, but that's what he meant. You're casting it on the wrong side of the ship. Throw it on the other side, and you will catch what you're supposed to catch. Now, this carries, carries a double meaning because he said, I will make you fishers of men. So what were they doing? They were going back and catching fish, but they weren't catching any. Instead, they were to be proclaiming the truth. They were to be spreading the gospel, the love of God. So when they cast it in, they cast it now, they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. Wow. Now they had a catch that they couldn't handle. They had too many fish. Whoa, how did this happen? Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loves saith unto, unto, unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat about him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Peter goes, oh my, what's he doing? He didn't care about the fish. Hey, the fish meant nothing to him now. They're out there, so what? It was my boat, so what? So the net's out there and it's full of fish, so what? I'm going to Jesus. That's what he wanted. That's really what all of them wanted. And so what transpires? Verse eight, and the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord. Now, envision the picture. Here they are, they fished all night. They're frustrated, they're tired, they've gone back to what they knew and were familiar with. They caught nothing. Jesus says, cast the net on the right side, and you will find. Now they bring in so many that they can't handle it. But because there were so many, normally it would have torn the net with that many fish, but no. This was a miracle catch. This was a catch that would change the hearts of these men. Now, as he did and made himself known to them through the actions and things that he did, they didn't have to ask. They knew this was Jesus. They knew this was the Christ. They knew this was the Son of God. Now in verse 13, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? What was he saying? 
do you love me more? Now, he could have been pointing to the disciples, to these. Or do you love me more? Pointing to the fish, these. What is it? What was it that Jesus wanted Simon Peter to respond to? He says, do you love me more than you love these things? Now, he basically was using the word agapeo. Do you agapeo me? Do you fully love me without anything in return? Or do you love me for this? You know, what's, what's the question? What's the answer? He saith unto him, this is Peter, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Now Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo. I'm your friend. I love you, Lord. You know that. But that wasn't what Jesus was asking. Jesus wanted Peter to make an understanding statement, underlying fact that Jesus was first to Peter, that the only thing that mattered was him. That when he jumped in, when he jumped into the sea and swam ashore, that's what he wanted. But now he's being questioned. Is this real or are you still double-minded? Because you have to remember, Peter constantly was shifting position, shifting position, wanting to serve, wanting to serve fully, wholeheartedly, in every way, shape, and form, willing to die for the Lord. It didn't matter. He was ready. He was, he was ready to stand with him no matter what. And when he came to him on the sea, walking as though he would walk by him, and they thought it was a spirit, and then when he says it was I, and Peter said, if it be you, bid me to come unto you on the sea. Now remember, Peter did. He stepped out of the boat on faith, took several steps on the water, but when he looked at the water and looked at the things that were there and the boisterous and the waves and everything else, he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. His faith at one point, point is ready, I'll do whatever, Lord, with you. And at the next point, fearful of the things around him, the circumstances that he saw. He was fearful when he denied the Lord on the, the night before Jesus was crucified. When he stood there and the people said, you were one of them, you're one of them, you're one of them. He said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. He was afraid of them. He was afraid of the situation. He wanted to be there with Jesus. He had drawn a sword and cut off a servant's ear, but now he denied. Over and over, this is where Peter was. But Jesus wanted to change Peter. He had said in the beginning, Satan desires to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed that you will not fail. And when you are converted, when you make that total change, strengthen your brothers, strengthen those around you. So, he says to him again, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou know that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. First he said, Feed my lambs. Feed the little children. Feed the young. Feed the new ones that would come in. And then feed the flock that's already part of me, that's walking with me. And Peter is grieved. He says, Lord, I love you. But he still didn't see the picture, not fully. And so the third time he says unto him, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. And then he went on to talk to Peter about what Peter would face and what was going to come against Peter in this life in which he stood now. He says, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, and whenever something is repeated in the Bible, you need to sit up and take note. And he said to Peter, When you were young, Thou girdest thyself, thou dressed, you dressed yourself, you walked whither you would. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Now, remember, Jesus was crucified on the cross. His hands were stretched out and nailed to the cross. 
Basically, he was informing Peter, Peter, you're going to die in the same manner, but not exactly the same manner. For Peter, history tells us, was crucified upside down because he did not want to be crucified, didn't feel he was worthy to be crucified the way his Lord was. But he faced death, as did almost every one of the disciples, except for John who was exiled to the, the Isle of Patmos. And so, when he spoke these words to, to Peter, verse 19, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me, follow me. Then Peter turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, or John, which is eventually who it is, Love following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter seeth him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Now, the rumor was spread that John would never die, and that wasn't what he said. He simply said, Then went the saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? The thing that is important is that you and I understand that what the Lord wants from us is what's important. Not what he wants from your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your son or your daughter. What he wants from you what he wants from me. That's what's important. He wants us to follow faithfully. He wants us to become one with him. He wants us to understand the abiding life and the relationship that is to be intimate between him and us, between the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and you and I. We have time here on earth to only complete what he has for us. For some, that's short. For some, that's long. If we fail in any aspect of that, we are failing and throwing away the greatest blessings that we can have. Because he who wins souls is wise and will shine like the stars in heaven. What are we doing? Are we doing that? Verse 24 and 25. This is that disciple which testifieth of these things. In other words, John and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Now think about it. Jesus is our creator. He was there in the beginning. He designed the uh, whole scenario of how we would be redeemed. It had to be through his own personal death. He's the creator. He knew man would fail. He knew man was incapable of being completely, totally without sin. And the soul that sins, it should die. So we have, in the very beginning, God's design for you and I, wanting us to live eternally with him, designing mankind in his likeness, in his image, and filling us with his spirit when he breathed the breath of life into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. Then when man sinned and fell into to sin and into darkness, the spirit of God was taken from man, and only the memory of God was there. Our spirits became dark. Our hearts became dark. Man became wicked, 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 wicked. Only very few found favor with God. So here now, we're looking back, you and I. We look back at the situation. We know that we failed. God redeemed us. God created us. Jesus created us. He redeemed us. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the alpha. He is the omega. All things were created by him and for him, and there wasn't anything created or made that he did not make. But now, he has left us with a job. He's left us with a purpose. In John 14, verse 12, what's it say? It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do will he do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. 
Now, we don't do greater works in uh, magnitude, but because of the Spirit of God and the length of time we are given, greater things can be accomplished through the body of Christ. We are all parts of his body. We all have a purpose. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, and others have been given different, different jobs in the way of ministry. Others have physical jobs here on earth to take the, the blessings and the designs and the, the, the uh, uh, dreams that God gives them to accomplish something, to build something. All these things are of God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. But we have a purpose, and that is to propagate the truth. That is to see the kingdom of God established here on earth as it is in heaven. That everything would be in right relationship. Miracles still happen today. I'm a walking miracle over and over again. Kneecap removed, given back by God, paralyzed, restored by God. Time and time and time again, he has touched my life and I have seen him touch miracles around the world. I've seen the dead rise to life. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen the dumb speak and the lame walk. Yes, he still is doing the same thing today that he was doing then. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that will never change. Now go to Romans. We need to put this into perspective. Chapter eight, verses 33 through 39. And this is the way it reads. Who shall lay anything, this is, this is Paul speaking to, to the Romans, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Jesus is interceding for you today. If you have a need, he's already interceding before the Father for you. It's for you to believe and to speak to him and to thank him and to ask. He's interceding. Who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died, yet rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. It doesn't matter what you think is coming against you now. None of that can come against the child of God. You are set free in Him. You died with Him. You've been resurrected to life in Him. And this is what Paul is trying to present to everybody so that they understand the magnitude of the blessings that God has bestowed upon His children. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus, when he was speaking to Peter, was wanting Peter to understand, I love you, Peter. Do you love me? No greater love hath any man that he laid, than he, he laid down his life. His friends, I laid my do life down for you. Are you willing to lay down your life? Are you willing to lay down all of this so that others could come and be part of our family? Is that what you're willing to do? Will you really do it? Will you now strengthen your brother? Will you turn from the double-mindedness to a relationship that is strong and powerful and firm? That's what Jesus was asking Peter. That's what he's asking us today. Are we willing to do exactly what he wants us to do? Are we willing to turn as well? Then go to Hebrews, chapter 7. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, there's only two verses that I want us to look at. 
And these are them. But this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus is alive and well today. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. He was praying for Peter when Peter was going through the test. He prays for us every time a test comes our way. He prays for us every moment. And how can he do that? He's God. He's not limited by circumstances. He's not limited by time frame. He's not limited by anything. He is limitless. He is God. And as such, he loves you intimately. See, it wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just John. It wasn't just his disciples that he loved. It was all mankind. And the reason he spent the time with them intimately and gave them the commission to go and to pray in different times, going out in twos to touch the world, was so that they would understand that his power is unlimited. That there's nothing that in him we can't do. In him I live and move and have my being. I'm a new creature because of him, and because of what he did, and because what I have accepted. You are the same. If you believe that he is the living God, the Son of God, that he died for you and rose again, you too can walk in newness of life, sharing the love of a mighty family, God's family. That's what it's all about. Jesus wanted them to understand fully. And he wanted to make sure that Peter understood he was forgiven, that Peter understood that Jesus loved him, that Jesus didn't hold anything back. And he wanted Peter to be willing and able to live in the agape love, sharing that kind of love with all that he would be confronted with, and trusting fully in the word and trusting fully in Jesus himself. We can only do that as we come to an intimate relationship with him. If we are not in the word, if, he, if we don't abide in him and his word doesn't abide in us, then we are limited by the thing, for the things we do. If we do, and that's where we live, we are limitless. Let's pray. Father, we come in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your care. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I ask, Lord, that it would continue to reach out to draw others to you. Help each and every one of us to submit fully unto your leadership, to seek your face, to see you, to concentrate on you and focus on you, and focus on your word. Lord, help us to abide in you. Help your word to abide in us that we might speak the things that you desire us to speak and do the things that you desire us to do. As you said, you only did the work that you saw the Father doing, that he gave you to do, and you only spoke what he gave you to speak. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to look to you the same way. Help us to be led of the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, and help us to realize the intimacy that we are to have with Jesus Christ, the Father, and the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.